Workbook. Good morning, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We're here in Denver, Colorado, starting off day two of our coverage at MWISE. So far, things have been amazing. My name's Savannah Peterson, joined by my co-host, John Furrier. John, I'm just grooving today. Yeah, day two, day one was amazing. A lot of great content, um, and then just continue to hear about the threats, um, a lot of nation state action, and also, you know, we're finding that ransomware is the top product. My gosh. Um, product market Never fit. talked about ransomware before in my life. It's product market fit for the bad guys, so, you know, its own industry, and again, more of this, you know, this commercialization of ransomware just continues to be the hottest topic. Yeah, de de definitely a hot topic. And who better to talk to us about it than John from Chalix. John, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. How's the show, buddy? You've given two talks. Yeah, yeah. You guys got a booth right behind us. You're a busy man. It has been a whirlwind. Uh, it's really great to be here. The talks were phenomenal. Um, I, I had time to watch the keynotes as well. And overall, it's a really, really good vibe. So it's um, it's good to be here. Yeah, it really is. What did give us a couple highlights from your talks this week in case? Oh yeah, I had two talks. Uh, one was on ran ransomware. Shocking! Topic. Oh, shocking! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, more precise around ransomware as a service, and that's kind of the the model that we've seen grow over the years. So uh, my presentation was more of like um, a, a case study or an overall study of like, okay, what was, how was it set up in the beginning? Yeah. What were the success factors? What were some pivotal moments that we can kind of highlight? Like, hey, this was a shift in tactics and that was a big game changer. As well as some of the cracks that we see, because with any empire, like the Roman empire or whatever, they will crumble and they will fall down or, um, evolve into something else. So we see some things happening that we think like, okay, maybe there's another shift happening. Um, it doesn't necessarily need some, mean something for the victims, but it is uh, changing in how the threat actors are collaborating together. Yeah. And the other talk was about uh, Gen AI used by cyber criminals. Wow, so, two of the hottest things you can yeah, be talking yeah, yeah, about yeah, this week, yeah. I love it. Yeah, even here on the booth floor, everything is AI and the criminals are using AI. So what we decided to do is like, okay, let's dive in, let's use our threat intelligence and get a better understanding how threat, threat actors are actually leveraging it. So behind all the, um, the, the, we could say marketing fluff, let's see what's really happening. And it was actually quite sobering. Um, we saw threat actors, just like us, trying to find solutions for things that they were that were annoying. So we had um, uh, an AI powered, actually through Gemini, was it that powered? They used Gemini to get more information on vulnerabilities, uh, web scanners, uh, they're researching some deep fake. Uh, there was one yeah. instance that was really interesting and very timely that they he was asking for, he or she was asking, I have to be correct, um, for an AI cloning type of, voice cloning type of uh, software. Uh, specifically to extort politicians and crypto influencers. Woo! Gives me the chills and I'm not surprised yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. I think we're only going to see more and more of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is, how we saw it is, it, there's a, a, we call it a point solution. So they're very much building AI solutions. They're embracing the innovation, but the real transformation, we haven't seen that yet. Yeah. So that's something we have to keep an eye out for. You Which, know, Oh, go ahead, John. One of the things uh, you may oh, see, ransomware as a service, that business model is working, and they're doubling down on it, shifting. But the Gen AI piece is interesting. Everyone's talking about it. Does it fit? Where's, where do you use it? Kevin Mandy yesterday in his keynote um, made a real big point about saying, look, it, users are going to use it. Yeah. So you got to just deal with that. It's not going away. Get a policy around it. He didn't really have any prescriptions around it, but he was like, just get get going on it. So what's your take on that? What are what is what does that getting going, getting a policy mean? What does that mean? Get your hands dirty, uh, start playing. What's your yeah. advice? That's an excellent question. Um, coming from a security vendor point of view, we often tend to focus on like, okay, how do we incorporate AI into our products? And when you walk the, the expo yeah. floor, you see that as well. And Kevin hit on a really important point because Two years ago, when Gen AI, well, actually ChatGPT launched, one of the first things our customer said was like, hey, this is great, everybody's using it, but we're so afraid we're losing our intellectual property or some kind of confidential or sensitive information is gonna land up in the, in the open public. So having a guideline within a company and um, 
maybe setting forth um, an AI council of some kind and looking at across business units where like, okay, where could this be a real differentiator? Because like you said, it's not going away, it's only going to get better and it's only going to get more accelerated. So identifying key elements within your company, within your yeah, logistics chain to see, okay, an AI component can help yeah. out here and be mindful of it. Uh, I think we, um, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so what you hear from a lot of companies, there's companies that are actually very um, conservative and they kind of roll it back to say like, oh yeah, we bought uh, um, Copilot or, um, or the, the things from OpenAI or Perplexity and uh, it wasn't being used by people. So that's what you often see. They, they will have a license yeah. and they roll it out and then what do you do? Yeah, you, you alter your emails or you, uh, you write your LinkedIn posts. And that's, that's not probably the way to go about these things, but having a core group of people that are enthusiastic, that understand the, the potential, and then identifying where it can really make a difference and being more intentional about why you apply your AI is something that we could, we actually highly recommend and we do it internally in Trellix as well. I think that's a, that's a really good point. I, when I, so I asked our community what they wanted to know about cybersecurity this week from the smartest people ever like you. And, and I love this because we're tapping on it right now. Sebastian, one of our uh, friends also in Europe, how, do you, I'm wondering, he's asking, but I'm going to frame it a little bit differently. Do you think that, because that's a great example, everyone jumps on the hype curve, wants to do the thing. Yeah, how is the thing actually going to see ROI? What's actionable? What's going to make it real? And, and what's the real value add? Do you think that security will actually drive AI adoption because there are more applicable use cases in this sector that will show that value add quicker? Yeah, yeah. I strongly believe that as a defender, if I look at the problems, when we talk to our customers, a lot of the problems they have with, okay, we have a plethora of tools, we have a lot of alerts, and um, a lot of times, when you're dealing with a real uh, a sophisticated threat actor, you will not get that high alert, but it's like a combination of lower severity alerts and trying to tie that together yeah. into an, uh, and raise that to your attention. Those are things that even the teams now struggle with. It's a great but point. The, the beauty of it is all the elements to make it work, so all the ingredients are there, and AI can help us actually stitch it together and let it bubble up to the surface and get the attention of the sock that it needs. So I strongly believe that there's a lot of advantage for security practitioners to leverage AI in their day-to-day -day practice. So you mentioned the, um, the threat actors are adjusting and reconstituting and, and moving around, changing their tactics. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's a great market for them. You know, as yeah. you say in Silicon Valley, they got product market fit. Um, and so it's, and then the tickets are getting higher and the bigger scores are happening. What are some of those tactics that you're seeing and how are you guys helping companies do that? Are you automating threat hunting? Is Gemini giving you guys more operational efficiency? Is it more captures, if you will, more, more um, changing, forcing them to change? Is, yeah, is it yeah. a strategy of increasing the bob wire? I mean, what's the, what are some of the mindsets? Think us through how you guys think about this and what are customers doing? So a lot of things we do, and mind you, I'm more on the intelligence side, so how we, uh, how we position our operational intelligence. Um, when we look at organizations, they're very much alert driven. So they will act upon an alert, something's going on, and you remediate, and you want to have a diagnosis. That's where intelligence plays a role. Uh, what we're trying to do is elevate that intelligence also to a more proactive stance. So if there's a weakness or there's anything else, or uh, let's say you're a, um, a company in a certain sector, or geo, we will provide you with, okay, these are the threats relevant to your sector in geo, and by the way, this is how they operate, and through our um, AI, our yeah. Telex Wise, we call it, we can actually give them guidance around, okay, but this is how these threat groups operate, and it's not only you want to wait until the virus, but these are all yeah, the yeah. elements in their attack, and by the way, you can increase your security posture by applying rule X, Y, yeah. or Z out of the box. So it given yeah. them more context about yeah. the attack, other than just an alert where you yeah. have to like enrich it and stitch everything together to yeah. get <laughs> understanding. Yeah. We want to give the power back to the team saying like, okay, but yeah. if you're in this industry, you're at risk of ransomware. This is what you can do now to prevent that from happening. Yeah, helping them have more impact. You know, one of the things I want to follow up on that is, is that, you know, one of the things that's not obvious, and Savannah and I kind of picked this out of the, uh, the, the yesterday's interviews with the, the experts here, was that there's a UX impact. 
to usability of, because yeah. you have more intelligence coming in, so there's more corpus of potential alarms and interest points to, to remediate or detect, actually. So how is the, uh, the UX piece, because now you have more data, and the old ad is, remember back in the old big data days of ad, it's like, this is too many alarms going off, I don't know what yeah, to pay yeah. attention to, so. Oh, exactly, there was some they all go off at once when something terrible happens. Right, who's dying? Yeah. Yeah. It's, just, uh, it's, just, uh, like it's a hospital, oh, no, so all the bells are going yeah. off. <laughs> so, so how is some of the UX side, because you mentioned the link then this is a productivity dream. Gemini's got great tools. Is that impacting the usability and the consumption on the threat intelligence side for the consumption of it to, to figure that out? How, what's your thoughts yeah. there? And, and, and do you agree that UX is a kind of part of this? Well, UX is definitely, it's, it's the conduit, it's the mechanism to basically communicate what is happening within your network to the user. So making sure that whatever's important is understood by the end user is the most, yeah, that's the goal. Uh, what we do see is that different stakeholders. You so you have a SOC operator that might have a completely different view yeah. from their CISO or their board. And where we see a huge opportunity, you're leveraging Gen AI is also, okay, can we translate the highly technical things to a higher level in a different UI? So uh, let's say the CISO just wants to know if they're compliant and then maybe towards the board that he can um, generate a report and saying, well, this is what we did this week. These were the threats. These were the threats that we protected ourselves against in more a different yeah. dashboard. So we highly feel that the yeah. UI can change whoever is the different cons the consumer. Yeah. Um, and then it allows for a certain tweaking and fine tuning. Yeah. And uh, you're right. If you if you elevate too many alerts, well, we're already in that situation. It's yeah, going to yeah. be like a Christmas tree. It's so, funny, John. Last year, Kevin Mandy was all about Gen AI. like, it's going to help us with report reports. Yeah. All those compliance yeah. reports that they slog through. I mean, that is just, I mean, that's a benefit. Yeah. But now we go next level. Okay, now I can help operationalize it. I think that's where we see the action. Uh, so I appreciate that answer. Um, I guess my next follow-up would be, how are you guys engaging with Google? You mentioned Gemini before. Um, a lot of Google could do a better job marketing because they have a lot of jewels there. What is it about Google that makes them unique um, in the relationship? And what is Trellix's relationship to them? Because you know, Gemini is looking really strong right now yep. and they have a deep security bench. I must say Transformer Paper came out of Google. So uh -huh. you know, they have the chops. Yeah, we have a longstanding relationship with uh, Mandiant as Trellix because of the, uh, the FireEye yeah. Mandiant separation and merger. And a long time, for the longest time, a lot of folks were uncertain if that relationship would continue. But I'm happy to say that our, our relationship yeah. is very and is stronger than ever. We uh, we really have researchers helping each other out. We're looking at similar threats. Yeah. Uh, some of the most um, imminent threats to the U.S. Um, well, the U.S. administration. So there's a lot of stuff that we're doing <laughs> together. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's across the board. Yeah. It's just from our side because we're. Uh, a product vendor doing security products, so we can see that a lot of our products is being used in the daily practice for Mandiant and vice versa. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're doing, and uh, we're not speaking about it today, is is a, a, a project called uh, RPP, or Research Partner Program, where we, uh, we help out certain nations in the world that are on a heavy attack, but might not have the yeah. funds to protect themselves. And together with, with, with Google or Mandiant, we, uh, we deliver Trollix appliances together with uh, joint investigations or joint uh, yeah. intel analysts to help protect Amazing. them and to learn more from the threat actors. So how do you uh, prioritize who you help in those situations? That's, uh, that, that is kind of, um, uh, that's a really good one. Uh, it, 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 it's it's gotta be hard. More, yeah, it's hard, because yeah. everybody has something to protect. So right. there, is, there is a way that together with Google, with, with the Google team, with the term like, okay, these have this to protect, or or there's a nation state, a, a country would, would would reach out to us and say like, okay, yeah, uh, we're trying to protect X, Y, or Z, and it's funny because it's not always the largest organization that would reach out. It could be an NGO, but they're doing something for human rights, and they're under let's say attack of, from a Chinese threat actor, and it could be very valuable information that they protect. So. Whatever they're trying to protect against and what their interest is, that, that is a decisive factor. John, two questions. Um, one, you're head of intelligence and you're principal engineer. Um, what are some of the known attacks that are constantly barraging everybody that everyone's seeing? And then what other um, intelligence are you, are you seeing that's new and or you might see happening 
And the second question is, what are you building these days at Trellix? What's going on inside the kitchen over there? Ah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I can tell you everything. But, uh, <laughs> I know. You don't want to give the bag any ammunition. Yeah. The, a lot of stuff that we see today, uh, obviously, we have uh, email appliances and email protection as well within Trellix. Email and phishing attacks is still a very, very big factor. Um, and so we also see a shift towards other platforms. So using um, uh, collaboration platforms. So it could be even through Teams or through a chat where you share files and it could be malicious files. Mm -hmm. So we see that quite a lot happening as well. Ransomware, obviously, but it's not. Ransomware is more a little bit more targeted. So you yeah. don't get the right spread. Uh, things like information stealers. So info stealers, as we call it, that's something that's really prevalent. And that's yeah. a precursor to almost everything because it's yeah. the objective of the threat actor will install it and will, their objective is to gain credentials. Mm -hmm. So they can then either sell it uh, gain full access or launch ransomware. Yeah. So those are some of the attacks we see quite a bit. You know, interesting, uh, Kevin's keynote, I love his keynote, I hope he keeps doing them because he's just so awesome on stage. He's coming on the cube later. His little note about the LinkedIn scraping and getting the job requirements and then getting in, yeah. if the insider threat is very much now, he, that was right at the top of his keynote. Um, have you seen a lot of that kind of act activity? Uh, over the years, we see it increase. Um, I think, it's very funny because uh, there, there was a company, uh, no before, that had an infiltration from a uh, DPRK operative that kind of used AI to fake his profile picture to get into the company. And I kind of referred to that as to Operation Dream Job, which was a major uh, research we did uh, in the past, 2.0. Uh, but it is a very common tactic of threat actors to either, yeah, get an understanding of like uh, what's the job profile they want mm -hmm. or uh, pose as a recruiter as well and just uh, reach out to certain people that are looking yeah. for a job. Oh, wow, that's and even that's, easier. That's the spearfish yeah. right there. They hit the yeah. Yeah. right away. Because it's very interesting, because obviously LinkedIn is a great platform, but it allows you also to say, like, I'm open for work, but my employer doesn't know about it. Right. And that is from a threat actor perspective. Let's say I'm uh, a threat actor and I want to know some trade secrets or whatever. Oh, totally. Somebody is already looking to leave the company. Well, if I pose as a recruiter and I kind of lure them in, and he might like, hey, here's the job offer or whatever. You kind of, you're it's very already, clever. There's yeah. that, there's that sense of trust, that false sense of trust. Well, I can tell you, we're on this recruiting call. You know, yeah, exactly. big salary. Yeah. Yeah. You but know that the people that you're approaching yeah. are vulnerable because they're oh, open they to totally look for are. else. And they probably don't like yeah. where they're working, or at least think it could be better. Exactly. So they've got opinions about something internally. I mean, it's it's quite clever. I'm curious, building on this and looking a little bit more broadly, what what do you think are some of the biggest blind spots consistently across the enterprise? Ooh, um, yeah. so we can do something really fancy about like AI or whatever. I think asset management, mm -hmm. actually knowing what you have within your network, knowing your attack service, so from externally, but also internally knowing like, okay, what's my security posture? These are some very basic things um, together with patch management, um, understanding the threat landscape, all that stuff. That's all, those are really basic things that we still see are, are, yeah, are not always done either correctly or up to a certain standard. And as well as, uh, well, password management, yeah. the age old, multi-factor authentication, we, we keep on saying- I feel like we'll be talking about that forever to yeah, a degree yeah, until yeah, it's all yeah, biometric yeah, yeah, or yeah. something else, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's clear in security, it's always been the ethos of sharing. Yeah. It's a, it's a very tight-knit community. Uh, as you know, obviously sharing and data is important. Uh, we've seen that for over a decade, it's clear, the ethos there. But this collaborative defense is a really new momentum. How do you see that? But well, what does collaborative defense mean? I know you guys work with Google and there's a lot of third party applications that have true security. Some don't, they fake it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Supply chain's a huge topic here. What is collaborative defense and, and what's the relationship you have with Mandine on that? Well, for us, it's um, there, there's obviously a commercial element to a collaborative defense. It's like we deliver certain products, they can use it in their practice. Um, but where collaborative defense really shines, in my opinion, is that RPP project where we share the intelligence. Everything we see that comes across the wire, we share immediately with our Google partners and with the organization we're protecting. And there's no real commercial benefit in that. The benefit is that we can improve our product. The greater good. The greater good. Collectively. And it, yeah. yeah, but we're not saying like, okay, I want to be the first one to report about it. No, if we report- It's we an egoless sharing to yes. a degree. Yes. Yeah. And, and that works really well. Yeah. And it just, it, for me, it just feels good as well. You're doing the right thing. 
that's one of the, the, the core threads between everyone in this industry that we talk to is that passion and that really yeah. desire in your core to do good. It's not just to be famous or to yeah. do any of this other stuff. It's excellent point. That's why one of our uh, core messages with Felix is called responsible security. So we want to make sure we do the right thing. We're transparent about our solutions, about how we operate with like, would it be from the kernel all the way up to how you can orchestrate our stuff? You can test our efficacy yep. all the way up to the work that we do with law enforcement or together with, with Google to, to fight off the bad guys. So you brought up kernel, it popped in my head. One of the trends we're watching on theCUBE and our research team is you're seeing uh, the ISV market going lower in the stack, certainly in the AI area, you mentioned perplexity and others. The, the, the actions at the kernel hardware level, silicon, Custom silicon's a hot trend. That, that came up on the supply chain conversation, from silicon all the way to the application. Yeah. How do you look at that from a threat intelligence perspective? Do you have to increase your apertures of more engineering? Is that what you're already doing? Can you, I mean, something in the area that everyone's now kind of waking up to saying, wow, it's not just where was the hardware, mm -hmm. where is the software supply chain, where's the data supply chain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the API, what's behind it? So there's a lot of moving parts. What's your thoughts on that? Ah, oh, <laughs> there's a lot to check. There's only so much ground we can cover, right? <laughs> and uh, we, I would like to even make it more broader. So um, we're even taking it to a geopolitical view uh, from a threat intelligence perspective where we're like, okay, well, where are the chips being made? Which country? Um, is there an export sanction? Um, where do they get the, the um, uh, where do they get the supply from? Which country? Is it the raw materials? Where do they get that from? Who has an interest in those countries? Who is doing a, a strong arm? And we're Lots of layers. I'm going towards Africa, for instance. Let's see, okay, what's happening in Africa? Because let's face it, this is going to grow. There's, there needs to be more silicon. There needs to be more ground materials to bake these chips. We need to have companies like ASML that will mm -hmm. make the, make the they'll, they'll, um, they will create the machines. Your countrymen there with the Dutch, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we'll, 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 we'll shout out there for out. ASML. I got, I got you, I see what you're but throwing down. There's pressure from, from different sides around the table, and that's, that, to us, like from an intelligent point of view, that, that's the interesting space. Because, yeah, um, it, it's often the geopolitical agendas which will give way if we understand that we can see where certain nation state attacks or APT attacks will commence because there's a political interest mm -hmm. to get some stuff. So that's, um, I don't think we're gonna see that go away. Yeah. It's gonna get more complex. But uh, that has uh, that's job security for me. <laughs> 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 that's, a, that's a great way to look at it and, and a good silver lining. You mentioned responsible security, a big yeah. part of your values. You also mentioned that fun is a part of your values at Trellix, which you love. I just want to give a shout out to your team. Oh, yes, you got the sparkly jacket oh, back so then. Yeah. yeah, I know. So y'all have been fun all week. Yeah. But it's nice to have that balance, responsible security and fun. You can have yeah. both yeah, in yeah. a passionate community like this. John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much Thank for you. taking the time you. with us today. And John, always a pleasure to hang out with you. I'm in a John sandwich right now. In case you've forgotten, my name's Savannah Peterson. We're here in Denver, Colorado, day two of MWISE. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.